Our final speaker, Arena Hankin, knows how complicated this can be and how important it is to have the trust of our communities. As senior project manager of the Gorin Group, Arena now manages the adaptive reuse of historic properties in Yonkers, but in her previous role with the Empire State Development Corporation, she provided oversight on some of its largest projects in New York City, including Atlantic Yards and Queens West. Hi, good afternoon. As Gina mentioned, I spent the last 15 years working on an economic development policy, planning and real estate development projects. I worked in New York State politics for 10 years, in Albany for three with the governor's office overseeing a number of state agencies. I landed at a state economic development agency shortly thereafter overseeing the Atlantic Yards Project, Queens West, and the Columbia University expansion in West Harlem. I left state service in 2013 and was lucky to be able to spend a year at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard as a Loeb Fellow studying innovative real estate financial models, participatory planning precedents, and placemaking. I came back to New York and worked in real estate consulting for a while at a real estate startup that now develops co-working and co-living spaces all over the world. And I'm now at a small women-owned real estate development company that focuses on purpose-driven adaptive reuse projects. So I wanted to talk about kind of the challenges that I've come across over the last 15 years, and there are many challenges that I've encountered. My perspective today speaks to the experiences that I've had working with economic development agencies at the city and state level. My goal is not to place blame, since I strongly believe that we all have a part to play, government, the private sector, and the local community. But I hope that this presentation will inspire all actors to perform better and have the courage to innovate. Projects initiated by economic development agencies are oftentimes developed in a vacuum, as we've been talking about today, with minimal input from housing and planning agencies. The focus too many times is just on delivering the largest number of jobs, tax revenue to the state and locality, and if there is a residential component, the maximum amount of affordable housing units. A holistic approach um, does not allow for a nuanced approach, and in my opinion, it discourages risk taking and innovation. The formal public review process, which occurs after the developer has been selected and the project plan has been finalized, is more or less meaningless. When these projects are presented to the wider, broader community for quote-unquote review, it often causes frustration and feelings of exclusion. There is too frequently a misconception that the community is able to amend the project at this phase, but substantive changes are typically not possible once the parameters of the project have already been set. And at this point, given the way our public review process works, the developers and government already feel a substantial amount of financial and political pressure to get the deal done. Unfortunately, too often we see this as the outcome of the public review process, consternation, anger, distrust. I've seen that because of the lack of an inclusionary planning process, these community activists often believe ongoing monitoring is the only way to exert leverage over these projects and to change the way the projects are being implemented. But there currently exists a rigorous methodology and signs to track and measure environmental impacts. Unfortunately, economic impacts don't have the same heightened attention. Once the project has already been approved and the construction begins, we kind of stop talking about them. Sure, we count jobs, and I do believe that we're getting better at this, but too many times have come into contact with delinquent players on both sides, the private and public sides, We're just going through the motions and doing the bare minimum to comply, or worse, not complying at all. And I strongly believe that there's improvement, room for improvement in this area. I think many of us would agree that the old ways of master planning need to be updated. It is just way too rigid, and it discourages developers from taking risks. I believe that there should be a more fluid mechanism that allows for change once projects have been executed. This change can be driven by the community, but it also should be able to be driven by developers as well without feeling fear of being penalized. Lastly, as it stands today, evaluation lives outside of the process and it is rarely pursued. The purpose of evaluating the successes and failures of projects is not to reprimand developers or embarrass leadership. It is to improve the way we build projects, to innovate, and locate solutions to ensure that all parties are benefiting from these developments. 
For example, a meaningful evaluation process could help us improve and refine both our public review process, our MWBE programmatic goals, and our reporting mechanism to make sure that localities are getting the most from these investments. There are many opportunities that could help improve outcomes. All parties are responsible for improving the way public-private development projects are initiated, government, private sector, and local communities. Education and translation for all parties is key. Too many times people are talking past one another and there is not a real understanding of the process, needs, options, or potential outcomes. The city of Boston's Office of New Urban Mechanics developed a platform called Citizens Connect that is able to solicit input from a broad segment of the population in real time. It engages the community at a personal level and helps residents learn how government works. Opportunity Space is a startup that helps cities interpret data to understand how best to catalyze community revitalization. Many cities are already tracking and creating a wealth of valuable information on property and neighborhood vitality. Opportunity Space just links properties to relevant economic development incentives to help shape and accelerate investment. Their online portal allows users to engage the government and even submit an application to purchase a property. Analytic tools are popping up everywhere to assist with understanding how cities work, where there are weaknesses, gaps in service, room for improvement. These tools can help government and private developers take informed risks and innovate. As we all know, technology is just a tool. It is not the solution. Feedback needs to be collected directly from communities as well. But technology can aid in the collection of this information and help to educate. Mapping to Mobilize is a technologically-based participatory planning initiative developed by the not-for-profit iSeed in Oakland, California. The platform teaches students about urban planning while collecting data from them about how they interact with their neighborhoods, what they believe is missing, and what are the areas that need to be improved. This is a screenshot from the mapping tool that I see teens used in Oakland to quote unquote ground truth, what the State Department of Public Health considered to be grocery stores. Youth walked the blocks, entered these grocery stores, collecting quantitative and qualitative data, including the amount of varieties of fresh food available, food prices, store hours, safety of the store, and more. Youth tracked, aggregated, and analyzed their data to conclude that the majority of these grocery stores, quote unquote, in East, o in East Oakland, in fact, do not offer much fresh or healthy food and would be better categorized as liquor stores. <laughs> Community engagement, which also needs to include ongoing education, is needed to truly learn about a community's needs and determine goals. Government and developers assume they know what communities need, and there are always surprises. And as it end, it is way more nuanced than just delivering jobs and housing. I oversaw a participatory planning process in Canarsie, Brooklyn, that's pictured here, that occurred a year after Superstorm Sandy, to determine the best way to make the community more resilient and weather future storms. And the process was ultimately successful because the consultant team became third party advocates for the community and led robust educational sessions so we all could begin to speak the same language. Too often there is a disconnect. And it takes spending a lot of time in a community to develop trust and to really learn about what their needs and desires are. In my opinion, another crucial component that led to the success of this planning process was that there were frank conversations about money. How much each project cost and asking the community to decide how to spend the funds. Too often we shy away from conversations about money and ultimately we don't have realistic expectations. In Canarsie, once we started having frank conversations about how much it would cost to buy and develop a building into a community center, the initiative was deprioritized and we started coming up with creative ways to expand community programming and share current facilities. Putting all the cards on the table led to realistic expectations and creative solutions. Take it to the streets. Uh, this is Team Better Block. It's based in Dallas, Texas. And I believe that taking planning to the streets and community participation to the streets is the only way to involve everyone at public meetings, as we all know. Even at these interactive participatory planning meetings, we tend to bring out the same people over and over again. 
and the population that has the most to gain from these projects don't have the ability to participate in those meetings. Oftentimes, parents with young children, those working long hours, and young people who don't see value in getting involved in the process. Team Better Block brings planning efforts to the community. And they work with neighborhood residents all over the country to implement these pop-up planning events. It gets communities involved, excited about what could be, and allows residents and government an opportunity to try things out, see how they work before they are implemented. The Women's Building Block Party, this took place in New York at a building that my company is developing. It was a decommissioned women's prison on 20th and 11th Avenue. And we held an event that our company designed and executed to ensure feedback from the users and residents who will be using the women's building. Um, and we had over 75 formerly incarcerated women in attendance with their families, as well as local community residents, to help us inform us what they would like to see in the building. And this is in addition to obviously a number of other community meetings and uh, stakeholder meetings as well. Improve monitoring. There is much data that we should be collecting about economic impacts, not only the type of jobs that are being created, but the wages of those jobs, the average hours worked a week, how long the person is employed for, is there any assistance with job relocation? With regards to local businesses, is there an increase in local spend as a result of these projects? Which types of businesses are benefiting the most and why? What is the commercial rental rate increase in the area, if any, as a result of these projects? Do these businesses stay open once the project is complete? And with regards to residents, how many local residents obtain housing in the new development, which we do track, obviously, but is there any displacement of other residents? Are there rent increases? Does the project trigger other residential projects? What are the new projects charging for rent? I could go on and on and on, um, but obviously we should be collecting indicators that show who has benefited the most and which populations have been negatively impacted so that we can learn strategies to prevent displacement and uh, prevent increased marginalization. Stoop.ai was started by a Harvard Graduate School Design and Esri alum, and they're using loca location-based analytics and 3D modeling to attempt to answer these questions and more. Visually representing the outcomes with the hope that all parties, government, the private sector, local communities, will better understand the impacts of not only rezoning, but also real estate, public-private projects as well, and trying to figure out a way to increase impacts to all parties is their goal. Real impacts to local residents and businesses are not being evaluated fully. Much of this data can be easily generated using analytics, but we're not spending the time to compile and, in and interpret this information. Again, stoop.ai is one of the few organizations that is attempting to solve for this problem. They, ha they help to evaluate different permutations and represent the outcomes visually. With the hope that in the future, Ultimately, information is much easier to understand to allow for more informed decisions that calculate all potential planning and financial outcomes and allows for clearer communication and being able to visualize outcomes to the public as well. Again, technology is just a tool. The parties behind the platform are just as important, if not more. And the only way to truly change the way we build projects in New York City is to bring new parties whose worldview and primary drive is radically different. This is a, an image from a design company in Oakland, California that works with formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated populations to find ways to design jails and prison that incorporate um, incorporate better practices to prevent reincarceration, so restorative justice practices. This is an example of a mediation center that they designed. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, Guerrilla Development, which is actually a majority-owned firm, although there's a number of women that work at the company, um, they develop funky and creative projects in Portland, and the most innovative piece of thing about this company really is that they post all of their pro formas on their website. So they're sharing their f financial tools and their created, creative financial models. There's complete transparency so that others can learn from what they've done. This is a picture of the zipper development in downtown Portland, and they've created space for for four micro restaurants, a punk rock nail salon, a coffee shop, and the facades covered with an art installation by local artists. 
And if you think those projects can only happen in Oakland and Portland, this is actually the company that I work for now, the Leela Gorin Group, and we are developing the old decommissioned women's prison that was decommissioned during Superstorm Sandy when it was flooded. It's located on 28th Street and 11th Avenue. We're converting the building into a women's building, a center of an empowerment that will house I think tens, 15 or so organizations that serve women and girls globally. And this is a picture at one of the announcements last year of all the female construction workers that we're gonna have working on the site. Um, we're creating a daycare, uh, community center, gallery space, art gallery. Another one of our projects is the power plant, which is located in Yonkers, New York. It's on the Hudson River and we, purchase this building and we're fully renovating it into a flex event space, but we'll be offering community programming, we'll be offering the space to the community at discount. We're working and partnering with local businesses and not-for-profits to transform this space into a regional cultural destination, but also a place of respite for the local community as well. Lastly, our organization, the Leela Gorin Group, is actually starting a not-for-profit that we just launched earlier this month called Girls That Built going to be providing scholarships and mentoring opportunities to girls who want to pursue architecture, engineering, construction, and real estate development. We realize that we need to start early if we're going to make a meaningful impact on the industry. In conclusion, ultimately, I am hopeful that we are moving towards a more unified approach where there is a holistic and inclusive planning process, where we learn from our mistakes and are committed to putting in the work to do better, and where there are opportunities for developers who are driven by the desire to give back, not just the bottom line. Thank you very much.